economic events in first quarter, how they've affected our investment model, and what we're watching going forward. We'll take questions at the end. We'll open up the phone lines for those of you who have called in. And you'll also be able to type questions in online as well. Um, I'd like to review our mission statement. We work with select clientele to guide and empower them to make informed decisions regarding their wealth. We provide our clients with the ability to make a significant positive impact on their lives and the lives of the people and causes they care about. We have developed a proprietary process. It's called the Wealth Impact Process. We provide comprehensive education, conflict-free advice, and risk-managed asset management with service of the highest caliber. With that said, I'd like to hand the call off to Bruce Frankel. Thanks, Holly. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. I just want to elaborate on uh, what we're doing with these webinars, why we're doing them, and so forth. So um, we're doing four quarterly webinars a year now. Uh, so we will have two of them that are opened up to everyone in our uh, in our database, if you will, the friends uh, of YBFP, as we say. And then two of them we want to have just client-only events. We want to uh, provide a greater value to our clients by doing some of these things. We also want to increase the transparency in what we're doing here, uh, what we're doing with our investment models, and, uh, and so on. Uh, so this obviously, as Holly mentioned, is one of our client-only events. Uh, the halftime report that we'll do in July will be opened up for everyone, and then we'll do another one uh, for the third quarter that will be client only again. So with that, let's get started. Uh, we're going to cover a lot of material today. Uh, we're going to show a lot of charts. We're going to talk a lot about the economics of things, so uh, don't want to don't want to uh, um, scare you there, but we are going to try and cover a lot of data. Also, I guess I should mention this is the first time we're using this technology. Uh, we switched providers. We didn't like how it went uh, technology-wise uh, for the launch of the year call that we did in February. So uh, we've been practicing and learning, so hopefully uh, we'll do a good job for you here. Uh, here are some of the things that we look at. We are uh, trend followers, so here are, uh, is a partial list of the things that we uh, look at as we're out there uh, trying to help you create financial plans for yourselves as well as manage your money. Uh, we'll get into most, if not all, of these things. Uh, this was part of the list that we did at the launch of the year call, uh, again, that we did in February. Uh, moving on. Uh, so here's the returns. Here's what the benchmark returns were for the first quarter of 2013. Uh, as you can tell, stocks had a very strong quarter despite many risks when we were entering 2013. Uh, commodities didn't do uh, so well. Uh, we've seen a continued shrinkage in commodities, especially on the gold side. Gold lost a significant part of this. I think it, it's actually lost more since then. Uh, the, uh, this chart here is showing the end of March. Uh, so commodities had a, have had a rough go of it. Uh, bond yields for the U.S. Treasuries, the 10-year was at 1.9 at the end of the year. Uh, as of today, it's at 165, uh, heading back down to record lows, uh, which is surprising a lot of people, including uh, those of us here. Uh, some of this is thanks in large part to the purchases made by the Federal Reserve. We'll talk more about that later. But also continued search around the world for a safe haven as uh, things around the world are, are topsy-turvy. The S&P 500 ended the quarter with a bang, uh, breaking through its October 2007 record close of 1565. 
Uh, before this call, I went to look at uh, where we are right now. The markets today are pretty much flat. Uh, the close, are, or we're at about 15.95 on the S&P 500 uh, today. Uh, looking at the bonds that aren't on here, uh, through the quarter, uh, the bond indexes fell 2.1%. Uh, That's the Barclays aggregate bond uh, index there. So uh, that pretty much covers the indexes. What have we been dealing with in, uh, in the first quarter? Well, the same things that we were dealing with in the last quarter. Uh, the fiscal cliff issue hung over all our heads until the last moment uh, of the year of 2012 and then only provided a partial solution. Um, in the end, taxes went up for everyone by uh, letting the payroll tax holiday uh, sunset on schedule this time. Uh, this really just brought back the tax back to where it was, so how much of this impact had on consumer behavior, no one really knew. I think those numbers are starting to come in now. Again, we'll touch on that shortly. Uh, but suffice it to say, politics as usual. I'm going to go into some detail here, and we'll continue to do that uh, throughout the call. But generally speaking, there continues to be a lot of skepticism over the current valuations in the market. The market has gone up uh, a lot uh, in the past 12 months. Uh, a lot of us feel this is artificially propped up by the actions of the Federal Reserve. Uh, as we all know, markets spend very little time on what is, quote, fairly valued. We overshoot either up or down. The markets have been very strong for 12 months. We believe this is going to continue going forward. Uh, we are also concerned, on the other hand here, I'm talking like a three-handed economist, so forgive me, but uh, we are concerned that the markets have gone up so much, so fast, and that we're entering another bubble mode. Uh, we have to be careful here about the herd mentality, as we know. Uh, human beings follow a herd mentality if they feel like they're missing out on something uh, as they watch it go up, 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 and up, then they'll start to enter and, and that could be the time for us to exit actually. Uh, there's still a lot of money on the sidelines. A lot of investors have chosen not to participate in the markets over the past several years after what happened in 2007 and 2008 for the fear that the worst was still yet to come and watching the pure economic numbers. As of the end of February 2013, uh, there was still $10.4 trillion estimated to be in cash. That's, yes, that's trillion with a T. And short-term investments including, uh, you know, savings deposits and, and all the short-term institutional money uh, has had a negative real return if you include inflation. So a lot of these people have not participated uh, in this market rise. Many money managers, especially active portfolio managers, have completely missed the move in equities, uh, which has caused a lot of people to jump in as of late and probably lead to the continued growth in the markets. Uh, so we'll see how far this goes. As you know, we believe that things tend to go too far, uh, and then we could have a correction here. So we are braced here for a correction, I guess, if you sum up our feelings. Back to politics as usual. Uh, as we entered, you know, 2012, the word of the year was uncertainty, as we say here. Is it possible that that's the deal again? Well, yes, it was. Uh, in addition to the fiscal cliff issues, we had the uh, the now infamous sequestration uh, that occurred. Uh, there was also uh, just a partial solution to this. Most of what they're calling sequestration went into effect. Some of the decisions that the government has made as far as how to make these cuts has been interesting. Uh, in a nutshell, what we're talking about here with sequestration is a reduction in the growth of the government budget by 2%. So just to clarify, it's not a cut in the budget, it's a cut in the growth of the budget by just 2%. Uh, 
Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we did have the payroll tax goes into effect as well as the uh, tax increases uh, on the wealthiest Americans. All of these things have kept us on pins and needles waiting to see what the politicians were going to do. Uh, another added layer of scary messaging that came out of the government talking about how horrible sequestration was going to be, I don't think helped a lot. Uh, but here we are. It's all happened. Uh, now what on the uncertainty side, the next things that we have to look forward to? Uh, this summer we'll hit the debt ceiling again. So we'll have to, as you know, the, the government does, our politicians do, they will wait till the last moment for a solution. We'll be on pins and needles again, waiting to see what they do about the debt ceiling. And of course, we'll get into the political dickering. Uh, we also need to watch Europe. We're going to talk more about Europe here shortly. Uh, actually, the next slide we'll get into some of the European issues, but it's been kind of quiet about Europe except for uh, what happened in Cyprus, uh, but we don't think Europe uh, news and issues have gone away by any means. So here we are, a picture of Cyprus, a tiny country off the coast of Turkey in the Mediterranean. That gave us all a big scare, really affected the market uh, for a few days there. Uh, the IMF and the European Central Bank came to a conclusion that included a large, I'll have to, you can picture me with my hands up in quotations, a large tax. Uh, some people call it a confiscation of people's wealth. Uh, originally they talked about it affecting everyone in order to save the Cypriot banks. Uh, that they were going to take a certain percentage of the deposits away from folks. In the end, they did so, but only for people above the $100,000 insurance limit on deposits. Uh, we think that everyone is asking a question that no one can answer. Is this going to be a model going forward to save the European banks? Will they do more of a, quote, tax on deposits? Uh, and I don't think anyone can really answer that. Uh, we are, we do believe we're starting to see people moving their money. And I would just ask you to step back and think if you had a large part of your wealth deposited in European banks and you had a concern that the Cyprus model was going to become the model all over Europe to save their banks, what would you do with your money? you'd probably move it. So is a large portion or, or a significant portion of the money coming in to this country as well as other safe havens around the world a result of people trying to get it out of areas that are in threat? Um, we also overcame other issues uh, and, and keep climbing the wall of worry on the stock market, the inability for the Italians to form a government. This took, I think, close to three months for the Italians to form a government. They now have formed a government, I think uh, just as of the other day. And this means they're going to start to have to do things. So we're going to start to see Italy rear its uh, ugly head and be in the news uh, more often. The recession in Europe uh, is persisting. We're going to show you a chart here in a moment that illustrates this. Uh, we think that recession is very deep, very broad, and it's going to take a, uh, a long period of time to overcome. And uh, we talked about the taxes here in the US. So we've been climbing all of these uh, concerns. Uh, the Federal Reserve. Uh, is continuing with its uh, bond buying activity uh, and printing money to do so. Uh, while giving testimony on February 27th, the, when the jobless rate was at 7.9%, the official unemployment rate, Chairman Bernanke said that it was his, quote, reasonable guess that we would, that it would take more than three years before the unemployment, unemployment rate would reach 6%. And as a reminder, 
Uh, Chairman Bernanke said that they would keep interest rates low until unemployment reached about 6.5%. So we do not think that the bond buying activity of the Fed is going uh, away anytime soon. Uh, we really don't think interest rates, the federal uh, interest rates are going to be uh, risen anytime soon uh, as well. The Bank of Japan, a lot of you may have heard that the Bank of Japan decided on April 4th to double the monthly bond buying that they were doing. So they're taking quantitative easing to a whole new level. Uh, they are committing to buying 7.5 trillion yen worth of bonds and lengthen the average maturity of the purchases by twofold to about seven years. As you can see on your screen, the previous maturity dates they were pegging was one to three years. Um, so this is significant. Uh, they have a new central banker there and they are not fooling around. Uh, the, announce, the announcement said Japan's benchmark 10-year yield to a record low of 0.31% uh, the very next day. Uh, this rate surged to double that, the, that level in the same session and traded. Uh, they just kept whipsawing up and down. So April 16th was the date uh, of all these moves. And I have some quotes here uh, of the head of Mitsubishi talking about this being just completely, uh, well, I'll read it. The, this round of monetary easing is without precedent. We must prepare for the interest rates to fall even further. The decline in yen-denominated interest rates is weighing heavily on earnings from capital. Uh, and we, we just don't know where this is uh, where this is going to go, we're seeing the yen uh, fall deeply. Uh, so, so Bruce, let me jump in and um, just clarify what that means. So, if the yen is falling, or the the Japanese government is flooding the market with yen, um, what does that mean? Um, well, I mean, we have to remember Japan has been in a low or no growth. Uh, environment for 20 years. I mean, a lot of you on the call, I'm not trying to insult any of you here, are old enough to remember the heyday of Japan in the 80s, but that went away quickly. And it's been now 20 years that they've been in a no growth situation. So they're trying to do anything they can to get growth going. Um, they're trying to look, devalue the yen. I mean, there's just no way around uh, saying it. Uh, they want to devalue the yen so they can improve their imports and get out of a deflationary environment. They're basically doing anything to get out of deflation. Um, what do you think is worse, inflation or deflation? <laughs> that's a, a proverbial question. Uh, I'll, I'll, I can only, you know, go back to my education and things. So uh, most economists believe deflation is more harmful than inflation. Uh, there's, it's really difficult to get an economy out of deflation. And deflation, once it starts going, really hurts people bad. That's when we start to see corporate margins just disappearing and, they, and layoffs uh, getting huge. So that's a really terrible cycle to get into. Um, and, you know, the, part of the problems here, if we follow the tea leaves forward, is that this is the thing that trade wars are made of because the U.S. automakers are not happy about this. So we'll see what ends up happening in front of the World Trade Organization, WTO, as the yen continues to fall and the Japanese automakers, as well as other manufacturers, benefit from that. But, you know, on the bottom there it says, where will the money go? It's similar to the situation of Europe where uh, I talked about money fleeing to protect their money in, in Japan, it's a similar thing. If, if there's no growth in the economy and there's no way to make money on interest with your money, you're going to move it. And I think that America, as well as other places around the world, benefit from that. But, all right, so moving on, uh, China. Uh, China's growth has been stalled yet again. Uh, they're still growing, but nowhere near where they were you know, four or five years ago. 
Um, they just recently announced that on this slide. By the way, I should mention that all of these slides are as of April 15th. Excuse me, we have to submit this to the Compliance Review Department uh, a couple of weeks prior to having this call. So some things have happened since these slides. Uh, China actually announced their Q1 GDP growth at 7.7%, which hugely disappointed. And you can see up there we wrote new normal. Is this the new normal for China? Has growth just happened for too long in China with, that we need to all start adapting that this is going to be uh, the new normal in their growth rates? You know, if China grows at 7, 8%, is that such a horrible thing? Uh, it might hurt expectations, and you know some of us get the expectations way ahead of ourselves. But um, if it is a new normal, I think that we'll all survive. Uh, we'll just adapt. All right, the March uh, 2013 employment report came in, uh, and it's really it's hard to put lipstick on this pig. Uh, it was pretty bad. Uh, the you can see the numbers here. I'm not going to you know, just go through and read them all. Um, as it, you know, rolled out, it, it just um, disappointed the markets in a big way, but the markets ended up turning around. Uh, it, it's a situation where bad news is good news for the markets because it gives people confidence that the Federal Reserve is going to continue their, their extraordinary actions and, and uh, printing. Uh, money, so it's kind of a dichotomy there. Um, I just want to point out again on the bottom, companies issuing negative earnings uh, pre-announcements. I mean, what we've seen now, um, you know, I, I was going to cover it later, but I might as well talk about it now, is corporate earnings have been coming in. This week is a huge week. I think there's 100 companies or so reporting. Uh, I would summarize corporate earnings so far as revenues, top line revenues disappointing, but bottom line net income doing pretty well. So this is a sign of good management, uh, companies doing the things that they have to do in order to maintain their profit and their margins, uh, but it's not a good sign when top line revenue is stalling like it is right now. So. You keep hearing bad news out of me here. Uh, you know it's hard for us to give you give you a lot of good news right now with what's going on with the economies around the world. Uh, this is something we talked about unemployment. Uh, for those of you who know us, know that we don't believe a lot in watching the um, government numbers on unemployment rate. It has too much noise in those numbers. We prefer to watch the labor uh, participation rate. The labor participation rate is the rate at which those who are ready, willing, and able to work in the economy are doing so at the level that they want. So in other words, those who want to work full-time are working full-time, uh, et cetera. As you can see here, the labor force participation rate is at a 34-year low. and We've been saying for a long time here that until we start to see the trend of this turn around, we don't need to necessarily necessarily see the number jump, but we just need to see the trends of this turning around. And until we do see the trends of this turning around, we just don't believe we're going to see significant growth in the economy. So did this have anything to do with people retiring early? Um, some of that, but once people retire early, they're not considered in this number. Okay. Um, so again, this is for people who are ready, willing, and able to, to work that, that are working. Um, and you know, the GDP number, the GDP number for the U.S. came out the other day. Again, since these, uh, this presentation was prepared, it came in at two and a half percent, which disappointed and was below all uh, consensus estimates. As well as when you looked into the GDP number, the, the biggest driver of that growth that did happen was from an increase in farm inventories. The farmers had a terrible summer last year. So the farmers are uh, 
increasing their inventories as much as possible in preparation. So um, again, not great signs. Uh, also, please keep in mind they're going to be changing the way the GDP numbers are calculated next uh, quarter. They're going to start including royalties. So royalties from films, royalties from books, royalties. So you know that may prop up the number a little bit. But let's move on. Housing. All right. So. Bruce, give us some good news. Housing is, seems to be stabilizing. Uh, the numbers in all the major metropolitan areas across the country have stabilized and are, are coming back uh, and are doing quite well. Uh, the excess inventory that was holding some home prices down has declined considerably. Uh, and let's look at locally. So, we did some research to go out here, and um, uh, this comes to us from Realtor.com. And I'm, I'm betting a few of you are giggling when you look at the variance between the United States median home price there, the fourth column from the left, and what the median home prices here in the Bay Area are, San Francisco and San Jose represented here. Uh, and as you start going over to the right, you see median price year over year, median price month over month. So we've seen some pretty significant um, appreciation in home prices here in the Bay Area. And why? If you keep going over, you see what's going on with inventory. The number of listings year over year in San Francisco is down 37.5%. These numbers are through March, by the way. Uh, in San Jose, down 51.37%. That's a huge decline in inventory. Do you think banks are holding back inventory from all the foreclosures? Um, well, they have been. I mean, they, ha they didn't want to flood the market with too much inventory. Uh, we think they're going to be distributing more and more of that inventory over the coming months. Uh, I, you know, that could be why, if you look at the month over month listing, the last column on the right there, you see some relief happening. But, uh, I mean, we're just going to have to wait to see. I mean, I think that some of that inventory is going to come out. I, just here in the Bay Area, I don't know that it's going to be enough to affect this here. Um, I have to say, though, here I, I'm, try, I'm trying to give good news, and now I'm going to lace it with something. You know, we get concerned when we see numbers like this. So why do I get concerned? Because it's just growing too fast. When we see home prices on a year-over-year -year basis go up, you know, here between 23 and 31%, I mean, that's a lot. Uh, you know, that's not sustainable. So we don't want to get into another bubble. Uh, Holly. <laughs> just to take a little break from uh, Bruce. Uh, going that, through the presentation. Bruce babbling on and on. Um, we like to meet with our clients at least once a year to make sure we're on track. So if we haven't met with you or you don't have a meeting set up with us and it's been over a year, we would like to see you. So please call me or Katya to schedule an annual review so we can um, make sure our goals are aligned. And that would be 415-334-8000. Thank you. The phones are open up. No. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So all of this blah 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 that I've been going on and on about here for a half an hour. What does this mean to the models? All right. So let me first explain what this slide is here. What are we showing you? Uh, as most of you know, we have several models here or sleeves of investment portfolios that we combine to make a model for a client. Uh, this is our most popular model, so that's why we chose it. And so this may or may not be your model, but we just, it was the most representative model. Uh, this is our, we call the YBFP Global Growth with Income Sector Model. Uh, the, it comprises 23 equity style, uh, sector driven uh, investments potentially as well as seven um, fixed income or bond investments. And then we weight those 
for a particular client based on their risk tolerance. Growth with income represents a maximum potential of 60% in that equity sleeve I described, <clears throat> and 40% in the bond sleeve. And so here, uh, so green here is cash, red is fixed income, and blue is, is uh, equity. And at the end of 2012, you could see we had quite a bit in cash. And as the quarter moved forward, month over month, we became fully invested and had very little in cash. And so that model was pretty much 60-40. And then in the past month, uh, you can see we stayed on the equity side fully invested and decreased some of our our bond holdings, and that went into cash. Now, current there is April 15th, so current there is not today. Um, so if you put all that together, that represents what is a 60% fully invested in the equity portion, about 20% in the bond portion, about 13% in cash as of today. This next screen, you know, brace your eyes here a second. So this next slide is showing you how, uh, what do I want to say, the makeup of this sleeve. So again, the left side up to 60% potential in equities, that right center side fixed income, and then the cash portion. So um, each of the blue bars represents a potential investment in this model. And you can see as of April 15th, and I can say it's pretty much the same today, you can see the weightings of each of those investments. Compliance wouldn't allow us to put the names of each of those investments on here. So we had to remove them. Uh, when we do a review with you, we're happy to show it to you. You can see it in your statements, so you know what they are. Um, they're on the equity side of the 23 potential, uh, we're invested in 17 of the 23. And on the bond side, we're invested in, as you can see, four of the seven of the potential. Now the next thing everyone is probably thinking, okay, so how did the performance do? And so again, just using this sleeve and your performance may differ, I have to say, based on other parameters that are going on in your accounts. So this is just to be used as a, a guideline. The equity portion of that model in the first quarter did um, 8%, just under 8%. And the bond portion of it was up just 0.3%. Again, the benchmark there was down 2%. Uh, so that each of you, again, could have different parameters. You might not necessarily be in this exact model. So how it pertains to you personally, uh, we would have to review with you. This is a slide here that we used uh, in the 2013 launch call. Uh, again, that webinar was in February. Uh, this is in no particular order, but this is what we were saying were the things that we were uh, watching for 2013 that we thought was an issue. Um, as you go through here, a lot of this is you know, what has so far been occurring. Uh, onshoring number six refers to manufacturing coming back to the U.S. We're going to show you some of the manufacturing numbers here uh, in a minute. Uh, the energy revolution that's going on with uh, horizontal drilling and natural gas has really been remarkable. Uh, follow the cash, we talked about that uh, money coming back. Uh, to the U.S. or coming over to the U.S. or other safe havens, and weather, what's going to happen with weather, or other things. Uh, I guess I should say at this point, we had a terrorist attack in Boston. Um, 
you know, these kinds of things, the geopolitical risks as we talk about there, uh, are just a part of our lives now, unfortunately. And our hearts and our prayers go out to the people in Boston uh, for what they've gone through and are going to go through, you know, going forward in, re in recovering. So uh, bless them. All right, so here's a crazy chart, but it's something that we are watching very closely. Uh, this is the, what's called the ISM report, so it's showing about the Institute for Supply Management, which talks about both the service sectors and the manufacturing sector. Um, we, this chart here combines those together, and as you can see, goes all the way back to 2000. So what I want to point out, hopefully you can see the cursor here. So I wanted to, this, I, I just love this slide. As you see, as we were coming supposedly out of the recession in 2009, 2010, manufacturing and the service sector started doing quite well. And then they turned over. And that's when we saw the first QE, quantitative easing by the Federal Reserve. And it seemed to help. It seemed to prop up the economy, and we started to see these numbers move back up. And then it reached a peak, and it started moving back down. And then the Federal Reserve, along with everybody else, started to become concerned about a double dip recession. So they announced QE2. And that brought, started bringing everything back up. I'm sure by now everyone is seeing the trend here. Then QE3 was announced. Where did my cursor go? There it is. And it started to bring things back up again. But trend followers like us, when we start to see lower lows and lower highs, it gives us cause for concern. And more and more the regional Federal Reserve bankers are starting to comment about this. That the actions, the extraordinary actions of the Federal Reserve are having less and less impact now. And does it make sense for them to do it again? Uh, when the risks of these actions are quite extraordinary, uh, primarily with inflation. So this is something that we are watching quite a bit and we think is indicative of what's going on in the economy. We're starting to see a slowing again in the economy. This chart helps demonstrate what can happen when there's so, uh, oh, I'm out of order. Excuse me. Forgive me. Uh, much like last year at this time, estimates for earnings growth in the third and fourth quarter are in double digits. In contrast to the, uh, those lofty expectations, last year's earning growth in the second half ended up averaging just 3%. So again, this year, the estimates for the coming quarters are likely to come down, and we're seeing that with the uh, earnings reports coming out, that people are, uh, companies are uh, setting expectations about earnings going forward. Um, analysts, uh, you know, predicting a 10% uh, third quarter and 13% fourth quarter uh, for 2013 year-over-year -year earnings growth uh, expectations are out of sync with the much uh, lower revenue growth. So as you look at this chart here, which is a bit confusing, so on the left it's talking the scale is about corporate profits after tax. And the right scale, the red line, is talking about the subsequent four-year annual profit growth. Now, the average here on the corporate profits is 6%. And as you can see, we are 70% above the historical average of corporate profits. Now, for those of you out there who believe in reversion to the mean, this does not portend well for what we are going to see in the future. We have to be concerned here. Uh, so this is another key metric that we are watching. Uh, 
Uh, this slide we stole from the 2012 launch plan. We talked about this, that we thought the markets were at an inflection point here. Uh, obviously, we chose this path. The markets have chosen this path. Uh, we are just hopeful that if we do see a correction, it moderates along here rather than jumping back down to the other of people having buyer's remorse and jumping out of the market. Uh, but again, something else we're watching. Uh, we've been talking about this for a long time. Co corporate profits are up. Balance sheets of corporations are incredibly strong, yet they're not spending money. It just came out, I don't know if it's today that I heard that uh, the numbers for corporate spending are still very low. Just look at Techie Cash. I love this slide. Apple has $137 billion sitting on the sidelines. They recently increased their dividend. It's still very paltry. What are they going to do with all that money? I saw today where they announced that they're going to be issuing bonds, so that it, they're going to be they're going to have more cash. Uh, another thing we're watching: the eurozone manufacturing trends uh, are just. This is Europe again is in a deep, broad recession, and this. These are the trend lines here that are showing you what's going on across all these countries. This does not include the UK. And uh, if you drew, if I drew a trend line on here, it would not be pretty for any of these countries. Uh, French unemployment was announced this week, 11.5%, a record high. Spain unemployment, 27.2%. Greece, just above that. Unemployment for people in Spain and Greece of people uh, under 25 years old is approaching 60% unemployment. Again, Bruce is the bearer of good news here, right? Um, the UK still in a recession, not going much anywhere. We did a review with the client this morning. They weren't able to make the call. I showed them this slide and they said when 0.9% looks impressive on this scale, uh, something is not right. Consumer spending, as you can see here, never got above the averages. Yesterday, the Commerce Department reported uh, that the growth of consumer spending slowed in March, uh, indicating that we ourselves are at risk of going back into a recession. All right, so what does all this mean for what the heck we're doing over here? Sorry to be so depressing, by the way, but we just want to give it to you straight. Um, this is why we manage money the way we do. Uh, we, want, we use fundamental analysis to build the models, but quantitative analysis to manage the models. Our goal is to have you participate in 80 to 90% of the upside, uh, but reduce risk when the probabilities of losses are just too great and have you only participate in 50 to 60 percent of the downside. We can't promise that. Uh, we won't promise that. I can't tell you what's going to happen in any given period, whether that period is a day, a week, a quarter, a year. We look to be achieving these goals over full market cycles and our historical returns uh, do show that. This is just a reminder. I think a lot of you have seen this slide. It's just pictorially, pictorially, that's a word, um, represents you know, how we manage money from a 30,000 uh, foot view. Uh, as positions start to increase, we will, and trends have been confirmed, we will generally enter around here and leave as things turn over, how you know if something is losing, we will get out. We won't just uh, sit in it. Um, we are looking to operate in this middle zone. We don't say we can find the tops and find the bottoms. That's not reality, and we don't even try to do that. So. Um, in the end, we have to be positive. And in the end, uh, we want you to stick to a financial plan. 
Uh, we are optimistic in the long term. Uh, this country will come out of anything. And the long term is always bright. Uh, we need to enjoy life. If you haven't gone out to the beach lately and get some perspective in the calming of the beach, um, we encourage you to do so. Uh, long term, things will be fine. So, since well, since the, I think people are pretty much done answering questions, I wanted to say thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Bruce, for your expertise. We appreciate it, and we appreciate um, all of you as great clients. Thank you. Have a great day.